Views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the program host and do not necessarily reflect or represent the views and opinions held by TCN TV Network Incorporated. Due to the social nature of this broadcasting channel, videos may contain content copyrighted by another entity or person. The TCN TV Network claims no rights to the said content. TCN TV Network cannot be held accountable for the copyrighted content. TCN TV Network is a messenger and sharer of information and strives to verify but cannot warrant the accuracy of copyrights or completeness of the information on this program. And then we expand on them with our I'll finish off the change by buying gum. Pardon? What? And it took me a while to decipher what he was saying. I came up with, we can get better at what we're weak at, and we can even get better at what we're strong at. Um, what makes communication healthy or effective? And I... Welcome, welcome to this edition of What Matters. I am your host, Eric Lita, and today my guest is Keisha Christie. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for being on. Now, if you watch my show, you know that I'm a fan of a lot of my guests. And this lady here is quite dynamic. And as I said to my producer before we started, I said today we have the joy of having a professional orator with us today. So let me introduce to you Mrs. Keisha Christie. She is everything, as I said. She is the founder of Talking Tales, a celebration of Afro-Caribbean heritage. Her company, Talking Tales, thrives on sharing culture through telling and retelling tales and preserving a tradition passed down for generations. Now, Keisha not only is a businesswoman, a published poet, an author, an entrepreneur, a volunteer, a Toastmasters, uh, whatever is the crown pinnacle of being part of Toastmasters, that's what Keisha does. She motivates college students. She is a member of the Congress of Black, um, the Congress of Black Women of Canada, the Ajax Pickering chapter. Keisha is everywhere and in the most focused way and that is really something to say her passion is sharing her passion is speech she how i originally met her was through social media one of my favorite mediums and we connected and keisha is one of those women that if she sees you and you're shining she reaches out and i had an idea and i reached out to her and what was so amazing what was so heartwarming in the tradition of the women that I know, she was like, let's do it. So for all of you out there that say, oh, you know, women, they compete and they're always going up against each other and they don't, untrue, find the right circle. Find the right circle. Keisha's done nothing but encourage me, encourage me in my ideas, encourage me with my show, supporting me, cheerleading, and I've had the joy of doing the same behind the scenes. Um, one of the events that you held that was really successful was the pose. Um, you did it at the Ajax Welcome Center. Oh, power posing. Power posing. And this is where I saw that this lady was truly on fire. And as the world is very small and connected, there's a lady that we both knew and didn't both know that we knew. She was a coworker of mine and she went to the, um, the Toastmasters. She was part of the Toastmasters. And in mentioning dynamic women and amazing women, this woman brings up Keisha and she's like, you have to meet this woman. She's so amazing. She's so dynamic. And I was like, ah, I know her. So Keisha, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to come on. And let's start at the beginning with you telling us what matters to you. Thank you so much for having me here today. What matters? I would say connection, uh, sharing, Supporting and strengthening ourselves as individuals as well as collectively as a community. That's what matters to me. And that is what you do. So Keisha, tell us a bit. So connecting. I love that. So that seems to be the theme of so much 
of what you do. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, when I look through all the things that I list, it's connecting, it's connection. And one of the great ways to connect is through our work. Yes, absolutely. So what, how did you start Talking Tales? What inspired you to start this venture? Talking Tales was a vision that I had. I love storytelling. And I, I've always been a storyteller, but I never found the right platform for myself. So I just admired from behind the scenes. And I thought, I'm going to create a platform. Since I haven't found it yet, I'm going to create it. So um, in February of 2019, I created Talking Tales, a celebration of Afro-Caribbean heritage. And with that, I combined storytelling of all types. So we had singers, we had spoken word artists and tellers like myself. And we also um, had vendors. So the two places where you learn the most is when you're hearing stories from your family members and friends, as well as if you've ever gone to the market and didn't know how to use a particular fruit or vegetable, they will tell you how and 50 ways to use it. So I wanted to put both of those scenarios in one place. And that's how Talking Tales was born. And from there, I've just been traveling around the country telling stories. I love that. And I love what you said about the market. Um, I love what you said about being taught how to use the different things because um, especially in the Caribbean, what's so interesting is holding up a fruit and saying, well, we call it this. And someone else is like, no, no, it's that. And, you know, it has like literally 50 different names and probably 50 different ways to prepare it. But what's wonderful is when the elders tell, you know, well, never do they give you exact measurements, but chop up enough of this and fry it till it's cooked and simmer it long enough and you have enough. So that Absolutely. that also, too, would be part of storytelling and, and oral tradition. And because we know our Caribbean parents, they don't write down recipes. They no. tell them to you. <laughs> exactly. Right? They tell them to you. So you said that Talking Tales uses different kinds of storytelling, correct? Yes. And can you tell us what some of them are? Like, what are the different types? So there are different stories in that. I specialize in telling a Nancy story. So if anybody, everyone's familiar with the Nancy, those are the tales that have been told for generations. They were told during slavery time and carried uh, to North America. And we still tell them today, and those lessons are still relevant today. There are also Aesop fables, which are basically anecdotic type stories where they all have a lesson. And when you go, when you listen to those ones, you listen for the lesson, really. And then there are stories that you tell personal stories. There are historical stories. They're all teaching, funny. So that's why I say that it's the best kind of edutainment that there is, because you're learning and finding entertainment. And so when you began this venture, did you find it difficult to find other storytellers? Oh, no. No. I mean, Sandra Whiting has been all over the I just do. So there are storytellers here. It's just, I don't live in Toronto. I live in Ajax. And in Ajax, there are not a lot of um, Caribbean background storytellers, but there are groups that you can go to. And I like being in the room and seeing myself. So I decided if there's no one in the room, I'm going to make a place for myself. And that's how I started um, doing storytellers with the, the group as well as on my own. I love the fact that you took the initiative to create what you wanted to see. You know, they say, be the change that you wish to see. And this is the perfect example. Um, some of these, these things that we hear, they seem so big and they seem so grand, but you wanted a place, you wanted to create a platform, you wanted a platform where you could tell stories. And you looked for one and there wasn't one. So you created one. Yeah. And that's what be the change that you want to see really means. So a question that, that I had, um, I think I'll ask the one that will take shorter amount of time. What has been the most surprising reaction that you've had to uh, telling a story? What has been the most surprising reaction? <laughs> I guess it would depend on the audience. Mm -hmm. um, children, uh, they speak it like it is. So they'll ask you, is that a true story? Hey, that wasn't right. So the, those are entertaining. But I also find that when you share stories with um, groups of senior citizens, they love to tell you how they connect with the story. And on this particular day, I had just finished telling a story about um, mermaids in Jamaica. And this lady came up to me. I think she was fishing for me in the crowd, grabbed my arm. And it was like I was her new best friend. 
and she was telling me about her husband and how they went to Jamaica and their life together and it was just like okay this is a little close for me but all right I'll, I'll roll with it and that was really amazing and so when you tell stories what you're finding is people want to also tell you their stories and you see, that's how the connection begins. I really do think that there is something about listening to someone tell a story, whether it's their own or another one, that, that starts plants that seed of people wanting to share. So when we come back from this break, let's find out what Keisha's favorite fable is. We'll be right back after this break. At Benjamin Law, we understand the real cost of personal injuries. As the victim of an accident, you may be the one who's physically hurt, but your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit benjaminlaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. Welcome back to this edition of What Matters. Today we have Afro-Caribbean storyteller Keisha Christie from Talking Tales with us today. And my next question for you is, what's your favorite story? I know that's hard. But that what's, really yeah, I'm putting you <laughs> on the spot. Or you can tell me one of your favorite stories. One of my favorite stories. Okay. Hmm. There are a number of favorites but I'll go with a uh, recent uh, favorite. Uh, uh, my daughter was having some issues in school, so I wanted to explain to her the importance of friends and knowing who to tell, doing who would be a good friend and who wouldn't. So I told her the fable about the bear and the gardener. The bear and the gardener. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the short version? I, it's a short one. Okay, <laughs> all right. So the bear and the gardener. There once was a gardener who lived on his own. His children had gone away, his wife had died, and he tended to the garden every day. He talked to the carrots, and he talked to the flowers, and they grew and blossomed, but he was lonely. He went out in search of a friend, and he looked high and low, but there was no one around. But he stumbled upon a bear that was lying lazily in the road. So he said, Bear, come home with me, and I will feed you and nurture you and be your companion. The bear thought about it and said, hey, I don't have to search for food. So the bear decided it was a great idea. So the bear went home with the gardener, and the two of them lived happily. As the gardener tended to the garden, the bear would, fly, would scare the flies away and defend the garden against uh, rodents. One day, the gardener was out, and the, the bear was there defending, and a fly flew in front of the gardener. So the bear flooded it away. And the fly came back, because, you know, they always do. And the bear got a little annoyed and swatted it away again. This time, the fly landed on the gardener's nose. And the bear thought, enough, enough of this, and swatted really, really hard to get the fly. And of course, you know that the fly got missed. However, the gardener was laying stretched out on the ground, and he had died. So now there's no more food. There's no one to take care of the bear. He's left alone. And the lesson in this story is, it's always good to have no friends as opposed to having one foolish friend. I like that one. And what was your daughter's response to that one? Really, mommy? She's 17. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really? But you know what? Again, what I love about the stories is that there's usually a lesson in them. There's usually that the moral to that story. And I thought it was going to go something like the, um, you know, the story of the, it's either a snake or a scorpion that brings another animal across the river. And then at the end, they get bitten or stung. And they're like, well, why'd you do that? And they're like, because I'm a snake, <laughs> you know? So I thought it was along that line of, 
you know, warning our children about friends. But that's something that I really loved about Aesop's fables and Anansi's stories. I mean, Anansi just seemed very mischievous to me when I was young. He seemed like, you know, the real troublemaker always trying to get like a shortcut and get his way through things. And there was a lesson there. But I was privileged. And if she's out there and she hears this, Miss Jacqueline Webb, she was my grade one teacher. She was also part of Black Theater Workshop. So she was really, she was an actress. And we were blessed that she read to us and she read us these fables and she read us the stories and she did the voices, you know, and that's these little voice. And she'd always, you know, articulate that. And through that, we learned a lot. Um, and I know not every child is that fortunate to have a teacher that's passionate about um, African stories or fables and so forth. And I feel that that's why the community is blessed to have you. Um, because not every teacher is going to teach that. So even though we usually do this at the end, Talking Tales, is it something that can be booked by different um, schools? Or do you present to schools? Like, where do you usually find yourself um, performing? Oh, different places. I perform at schools, uh, fashion shows, hair shows. I've done that. Um, there's a picture of me in a school there. Okay, and so you're in a school at this? this? Yes. Okay. And the different, now the background, were there actors too, or is that just part of your backdrop? That was an activity. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, it was the part of the backdrop that was set up by one of the teachers, and I used that to create a story. So we had four students come up, and I started the story, and then we continued the story to the end, and then I wrapped the story up. So each student got, had the opportunity to participate. So I've done that. Uh, we have, I've done schools. I do... Uh, I speak with Durham Storytellers, so that's a monthly gathering, and when they have events at uh, nursing homes and other venues, I attend there as well. Amazing. So now tell us a bit about finding your voice. I always talk about the importance of finding your voice because I'm a storyteller now, but I was afraid. I would watch other people speak and be afraid to speak myself. So I would write poetry and I would have all of these prose, and when it came to saying, my voice would get stuck in my throat. So when I joined Toastmasters, I quickly caught on to the techniques to help me speak better, speak louder, and be more confident in myself. And I thought, I really like speaking, but I love telling stories. So when I fell on the opportunity to share stories from, they actually asked for a folk tale. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, this is my niche. So I shared an, a Nancy story with them. I believe it was a Nancy and the Pot of Wisdom. And when I did that, I realized that I could play with my voice any way possible. I went in and out of Patois and because it was a mixed audience. And it was just, <laughs> I found my voice. I was able to share. And it's so important for us to do that because you can't learn alone. And yeah. not everybody, when you have to read something, I got to be honest, you scan the first, is this important or can it wait for later? But when somebody is sharing with you and they're, be making themselves vulnerable or they're sharing their success, you you pull, you feel it. You feel mm -hmm. it for them. You're, you become their cheerleader or you realize they've overcome, so can I. Or maybe I can share my experience and see where it goes. But it's all about interacting and talking. And our tradition, our culture is to share stories orally. So without a voice, it's difficult to do that. But once you're sharing and you continue to share, you're attracting others. So while I put together Talking Tales, I'm finding other storytellers that are in Toronto that are sharing in other circles and I have the opportunity to bring them together on this platform. That's amazing. So in finding your voice, one of the major things you're saying is to find people to share with, to practice with. Well, yeah, of course. But you're sharing every day. It's just you share with your family, you share with your coworkers, you, you, the water cooler chit chat. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about uh, whatever show was on, sisters or whatever was on the night before. You're talking about maybe an issue, something that maybe have, you have to deal with in the, in the boardroom. But then something about sharing your own personal story, being vulnerable. You want to find a group that you can do that with. And when you do that, you're able to just empower others as well as empowering yourself. Because especially if you're, you're dealing with something traumatic and you share that story, it takes the sting out of it so that you can say it in a way that lifts you up and helps someone else get that, get the lesson from your story. I wish I had the ability to remix that little part that she said. 
I think that's so important. When people talk about, you know, people sh oversharing on social media or why would you tell anyone that embarrassing story or, you know, this idea that you only share the shiny stuff, put all the, you know, tuck the other stuff away, that's not where the power comes from. No. That no. is not where your healing comes from or your joy comes from. There is so much power in sharing your personal story and honestly, your failures, your defeats, because what you come to find is that so many other people experience the same thing and you encourage others. Absolutely. And to, you know, looking at some of the pictures that Selena was putting up, I mean, I love to watch you speak. I love the passion with which you speak to see you with the microphone like this. This t is so inspiring to me. And to even think that that woman on the screen was ever afraid is mind boggling to me. It is that woman was afraid to stand up and speak. You look like you were designed for that, but you were. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You just didn't. I didn't know it yet. You just didn't know it yet. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so grateful. So what would you say really brought you there? Would you say that that experience through Toastmasters was no. it or? It started long before then. Okay. I've always been exposed to storytelling. I've done volunteer work with the Storytellers Festival, and um, I've been a huge fan of uh, Miss Lou. So my mother will tell you that I've been a Miss Lou fan since I was born, and it was just I met her, and then she said a few words to me that I remembered but I vaguely, and then it was this past year that just seemed everything seemed to bubble over, where everything I found the connection through everything. Um, I was asked to speak at a church. And while I was there, I literally heard what she said to me, open up your mouth. And I was like, what? where did that come from? And the story that came out of me felt like it burst through my chest. And when I watched the video after, I couldn't believe it was me. Couldn't believe it was me. And then I also ended up meeting uh, Sandra Whiting in person. And I've always wanted to meet her and talk about storytelling, but never had the opportunity. Well, I spent four hours on a plane with her. So we had an opportunity to talk and share. It just seemed like everything this year fell into place. The event, everything rolled into one. I was going to say that it seems like everything aligns. When we come back, we're going to talk a bit about why stories are so important and finding strength and vulnerability. But I also too want to touch on that clicking and how there is so much power in your purpose. So when we come back from this break, we'll, we'll talk about walking in your purpose. We'll be right back. Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity in our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by Remax West. Welcome back to this edition of What Matters. I'm here today with Talking Tales founder, Keisha Christie. And right now we're talking about everything clicking when you're walking in your purpose. And that's what happened to you in 2019. Absolutely. All the people you wanted to meet, all the things that you wanted to do involving this just seemed to all fit together. It started out with uh, Talking Tales, the celebration of uh, African Caribbean heritage. I planned the event. I was able to bring together storytellers of all kinds, uh, singers that I hadn't met in person. I was I met them on social media, but I was able to meet them in person, and the event just, it was beautiful. And then I thought, well, how do I continue that? And then I started telling stories with, in schools. 
all ages from kindergarten to I think it was grade seven. And then I moved on to joining Durham Storytellers and I was just all over the GCA sharing stories and then uh, had the opportunity to go on a trip to Jamaica with the, the Jamaican Canadian uh, Society and I was just, association, sorry. And on this trip, I had no idea. I just paid my money and thought, I'm going on this trip. It's all about Miss Lou. I'm Miss Lou and I'm doing it. And I got on the, I, I literally got there and I was like, where to go writing? And I've always wanted to meet her and here we are. And being on that trip and learning and listening to other storytellers, it's just, I just kept taking every step forward and it's just, everything just started to click, click, click and it was perfect. But I feel like if I started earlier, maybe it wouldn't have. If I did one or two things differently, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have become what it is right now. And um, what's humbling is that when there's a post on social media about storytelling and I've got ladies that I know putting my name, I was like, well, where? I've got tagged on something and they're showing appreciation because I'm able to touch, the, touch their lives. And I'm thinking, wow, that's so humbling. And I started off by being afraid to speak and yet here I am where I'm being recommended to attend events and share stories. And I just love doing it, finding that connection is, it's an amazing thing. Well, you're about to be recommended for another uh, elementary <laughs> school in Durham because I really feel that my son's school needs to hear some stories um, about Anansi and the fables. And, and there's such, especially when they're done with passion. You know, it, anything you read, it could be so dull and monotonous if you just put your voice. But when people read with passion, when people not even read, but tell a story with passion, it comes from the heart. It, it is such a different experience. Um, now, one of the things that, I mean, you say it, if you go to TalkingTales.com, um, it's dot .com or .ca? .ca. Mm -hmm. TalkingTales.ca, there's wonderful summary, and on it, you know, it talks a bit about Keisha, and it talks a bit about Talking Tales, but I'd like you to tell the audience, why are stories so important? Like, why is there, you say there's strength and vulnerability, and that is definitely something I've learned. Um, there is so much power in asking. Mm -hmm. There's so much power in saying you're not okay or you're in need. Um, and I think that so many of us believe that that's where you show your weakness and you're most vulnerable and you're like a turtle on your back. But I agree with you that there's strength and vulnerability. And, and what do you mean by that? What I mean is whenever you put yourself on a, on a platform, whether you you could post a picture on social media and you know you may not feel 100 percent about that photo but you may think it's the worst photo you've ever seen and somebody else is telling you how beautiful you are oh did you notice those freckles and you're thinking oh that's my worst part when you put yourself out there anywhere whether it be on stage and you open your mouth to speak the worst critic is yourself when you put yourself out there your message resonates with someone. Um, every story that I tell, it's different every time you hear it. Mm -hmm. And people often ask me why. And I'm like, it's generally the same content, but somebody needs to hear a different part of the lesson and that's emphasized. I don't have control of the story. That's why um, a lot of mis when you tell um, Caribbean storytellers, they'll say, Jeff Mandora, I mean, I choose none. I'm not responsible for the story. It just comes out and it comes out and it touches your audience. It touches an individual. And it, it's how they connect. So being vulnerable, it's not just sharing your low points. It's sharing your high points. Yes. It's, I stumbled, but I got back up. Mm -hmm. It's showing people that, yes, you hear it. Yes, we post it. But here I am living it. What are you going to do? Yeah. And if you never share it, no one will know. Lessons get missed. We don't talk to people. There was a time where black women just passed each other in the street. Yep. Whereas now, we say hi. Oh, yes. Girl, your hair, your yes. outfit. Now we're talking to each other and we're finding out that so many women have all these talents that we would have never known if we didn't say hello. So now it's as simple as saying that hello, that you make yourself vulnerable. You make a new friend who can do jewelry, who can do your hair. You, you connect with people on a level. You may find somebody who's going through an illness or sickness and you share and find out that you've overcome or they're sharing, and you just continue to connect. 
a bit, you know, I, I'm just, we're looking at some pictures from, this is from the last event, correct? Yes. Um, but if you, the camera's on me, you see I've just grinned like an idiot <laughs> because everything you said is so important. And looking at that photo, even that one there, mm -hmm. the connection, um, there's something so powerful about meeting a stranger and your soul's clicking. Absolutely. There is something so tremendous and so amazing about that soul click. And you can know someone deeper that's a stranger than somebody that you've been friends with for years because your souls recognize one another. Yes. And I feel that that's what vulnerability does is when, like you said, it's sharing your highs, it's sharing your lows. But in saying that hello, I mean, we said hello. And then one day we were in a coffee shop planning out, you know, strategies for something that actually very well may be coming in 2020. Mm -hmm. But that is exactly what we find. And even for myself, speaking to strangers or doing a Facebook Live, by the way, this whole show came about because of my Facebook Lives and somebody saying to me, you have a show. And I was like, no, I don't. I just talk in my phone. That's it. And they were like, no, 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 I see something there. And then having that echoed and reinforced and other people. And sometimes, like you said, we're our own worst critics, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And we're the ones who think we never do anything well enough, while other people wish that they could do it as well as we do. So there is so much power in, in the sharing and in, in, in sharing your truth, I think. Yes. In sharing your truth. And so you mentioned some, one of the things I actually want to go back to is you were talking about um, going in and out of Patois. Now for our non-Caribbean um, viewers, if you would explain, because there's a lot of power in that switching. Now it is not an entirely different language, although some people like to believe <laughs> so. Um, and one of the things that I found out years ago was that there are books written in Patois. There's um, actual um, rules, like writing rules for it. Grammar. Conjugate, yeah. Grammar, conjugation, oh. so forth. So if someone really does speak Patois and you're fronting, they'll know because you won't conjugate properly. There is, believe it or not, one of the rules I say is, especially for Jamaican Patois, if it starts in an H, you leave it off, and it has no, if it starts in a vowel, you put on an H. I believe that is one of the basic rules. <laughs> but... Um, Tell me a bit about that. Like, does, do you find that the audience reaction changes when you switch dialect, I guess would be the proper term? Yes. And yes. Uh, I found when I did the performance in the church, the church was a mix of uh, Caribbean and non-Caribbean people. And when you're telling the story and I'm telling them that a Nancy went here looking for knowledge, and then when I went in and said, well, him drop the something, the, ro the roar, because they see themselves. Like you see yourself, you automatically connect because you're authentic, you know. I mean, mind you, I'm not French. I was born in Canada, but I did the work. Um, I listened to my auntie speak. I listened to my, my family members speak. And that is a part of who I am. So I learned, not just so that I could have conversation, but when you put, play it in and out of a story, people connect differently and then they resonate with you later. And that's what I was going for. I wasn't going for the look it up in the book and be able to say non-swear words in Patois. I wanted to be able to really connect. And so, and so with non-Patois speakers, is that even a thing? But um, I guess Canadians, people who aren't, what do you find the reaction is? Like, do you see... Do, do you see an appreciation? Do you see a curiosity? There's curiosity, especially when you're using real words. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a video online where uh, Miss Lou is talking about the Patois language and that there's a misconception that it's, it's, it's broken English and things like that. It's mm -hmm. an actual language yes. and it's based a mixture of a Spanish, a Portuguese, and a tree, which is an African language. And uh, she was talking about her term dotty tough and how you'll see this person talking about dotty this dotty that and it's like it means ground would you really say that if you knew the meaning of it so it, when you know it and you're able to actually educate while you're speaking and i find that especially when you're talking to young kids i did a session when i was in a 
middle school kids. And I said, well, let's learn Patois. Everybody wanted to learn Patois. So I clarified, it's not this, it's a, you know, and I told them what it was. And when we learned of how to say uh, Wagwan and what it meant, or um, you're good, it, it, you're teaching them the phrases to use. And it's not just, um, let me throw out a swear word here and there. So they're getting authentic Pick. language that Edu- they can... Educate, educate. Edutainment. Edutainment. Exactly. I love that. And they can grow on it. And you know what? I am going to ask Keisha for that link to Miss Lou's video because I think that would be something great to share on my page. So... When we come back, we are going to, can you believe we got to wrap it up? Oh my gosh, already? Already. That's section four, right, (laughs) Selena? Going to section four. So when we come back, we are going to let you know how you can contact Keisha, how you can book a talking tale. And I don't know, do you you accept new members? Is this something you can join? Huh. Next step. Next step. Yes, we will be talking next step. So we'll be right back after this break. World-famous spiritual astrologer and psychic, Pandit Sai is born to serve people. He's an expert on palmistry and horoscope. He can handle all problems and give Vedic solutions for business, job, love, marriage, husband and wife problems, children, personal, and many others, including depression. He also performs pujas to clear all sorts of obstacles. Call Pandit Sai and see changes in your life now. 647-766-1419 Located at 2895 Derry Road, East Mississauga, Airport Road and Derry. My name is Trish Curling and I am an online coach, personal trainer and yoga teacher and your new host of Shaping Life, which is all about understanding that we have the ability and the control to take charge of our health and wellness. but we can't do it alone. And I can't wait to sit down with the best in the industry. Please tune in every Friday at 1 p.m. live here on the TCM Network. Welcome back to this edition of What Matters. I'm here with Talking Tales founder, Keisha Christie. Thank you for being here, Keisha. Thank you for being inspiring. You guys have seen all of my teeth this episode because this lady really makes me smile. I'm sure you can feel her energy through the screen. I've had the pleasure of seeing her her perform, her speak, her her passion, and you cannot hide authentic light. You can you could put it in a dark room, steel doors, close it off, and it's going to shine through. And I really believe if there's something else that's more for you, I got to know what it is because this really seems to be your light. Um, Telling these stories and constantly inspired by your posts. I've watched your journey online, you sharing your fitness journey, all of it. And you're absolutely right that you have no idea who you are inspiring when you share. And one of the trends recently with social media is that some platforms are getting rid of actually seeing how many likes they are. And I think that really works for it to to the advantage of most because I think people got really caught up on numbers and likes and started to forget about content. You know, lots of great filters out there. You can make almost anything look pretty. Um, But when you see people in their authentic selves dealing with their struggles, um, winning small battles, which are huge to them. Um, if you've ever suffered any kind of illness, you'll know that getting out of bed sometimes is a huge accomplishment. Um, sometimes we'll see somebody going down the street and they're currently at 300 pounds and they're sashaying down the road and you're like, nah, but you don't know they're coming from five. You know, so again, I think that what you share and how you share it is so important and you are a shining example to our youth and I am very grateful for the things that you do. So before we leave you today, I would, you see, and this is where you get like a little free show. I'm going to ask Keisha to share a story with us, but also to before we do that, before this and after, because you got to plug your plugs, right? What's coming up, Keisha? Oh my goodness. Talking Tales 2020. We are having our event on Saturday, February the 8th, and it is going to be amazing. So we've got tellers, um, Adam Mari, 
um, Hev- Ken Bow- Bowen. We've got uh, Shashoya. A number of tellers coming. We've got uh, Safia, who is a spoken word artist, and Shakoi. We've got uh, authors such as Julie Tom- Thompson and uh, Ra- Rocky, who's always coming, who's coming as well. So we've got Elaine Robinson coming back again to address the stage. So there's going to be music. There's going to be singing, dancing. There's going to be spoken word. There's going to be tellers, of course. And then we're going to have our marketplace where we're going to have local vendors um, from the Caribbean as well as other places that are going to be there. So if you want to buy local, this is where you want to be. This and you do want to buy local. Be. So you have to get your tickets. Don't be in the lineup. Yes, exactly. Don't get your tickets. To get your tickets now. And, you know, the quicker we get our tickets now is the quicker we can pressure Keisha to make the um, spring summer edition. Um, so do get your tickets. And we will put that up again before the end of the show. It also will be on my page. And I will be at the event because it should be covered and people have to see what's there. So if you are not there in person, which you should be, um, I'm going to give you a taste of what you are missing. So this is where, you know, knowing all these fabulous women and men comes really to, into play and to my advantage because I get the joy of their talents. I get the joy of, you know, enjoying their talents. So will you share with us, please, a story? I will. <laughs> Have you ever wondered how a spider's waist got so small? Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, let me share a story with you, shall we? Anansi woke up one day and decided to go for a walk. Now, as you know, Anansi's rather lazy and he didn't want to cook or do any cleaning, but decided to go for a walk. On the path, he ran into Zebra. Zebra was carrying a basket of, of goodies. So Zebra said, Anansi, Anansi. Hey, Zebra. Well, go on. Hmm. Guess what, Anansi? We are having a launch date. Let me tell you how many people are coming. And we are going to be serving all the American foods. You like American foods. Hot dog, hamburger, french fries, all those things. Anansi started to think about the food and how good it would taste. Yeah, I can come for that. All right, so come, Anansi. But you know, Zebra, I have a few things to do. You see, Anansi didn't want to help with the cooking, but he definitely wanted to do the eating. So Anansi tied a string around his waist and gave the other end to Zebra, and he said, when the food is ready, you just pull the string and I will come. All right, Anansi. And off to the west, Zebra went. Anansi continued to walk down the road, and he bumped into Elephant, and Elephant was struggling with his goodies. And Anansi said, Elephant, how are things? Well, Anansi, I'm having some people over for lunch and we are making West Indian food. And let me tell you, I burn up the rice and now I have to do it again. Will you come? I mean, everything else is fine. Just the rice have to be over. Well, huh, West Indian food, I mean, an oxtail, maybe a few peas. Depending on. All right. Elephant, that sounds good. I'll come. All right, come then, Anansi. Well, the rice still have to cook, and Anansi doesn't want to help with that. So Anansi tied a string around his waist and gave Elephant the other end and said, Hey, Elephant, when the food is ready, I'll tell you what you do. Just pull the string, and I will come. All right. And off Elephant went to the south. Anansi continued down the road. And this time, he bumped into Giraffe. Now, Giraffe is always clumsy, but could cook. So when Anansi saw Giraffe, he thought, now I can get some other goods. So Anansi said, Giraffe, what's cooking? And Giraffe said, well, Anansi, I'm having a few people over for lunch, and we are making Italian food. You know, spaghetti and all those things. Maybe a little salad. Wow. You're inviting people to that, Anansi asked. Of course, you can come. All right. So the food is ready? No, not yet. I still have to cook it. I tell you what you do. Let me give you this string. And Anansi tied the other end around his waist. And he said, when the food is ready, give it a pull and I will come. And off Giraffe went to 
to the east. So Anansi went and continued down the road, and he thought, why? Oh, that's weird. Yeah, weird. And Anansi was starting to look at the different vegetables, and he picked up a squash. And when he picked up the squash, he felt a little tug. Hmm. But of course, you know, there's one direction Anansi's not going in yet, right? So Anansi bumped into a boar. Boar. Oh. And boar. Oh, was chugging down. And Anansi said, where are you going in so dog? Ah, people are coming, and I still have to finish. I have to finish the seafood. I have to get the seafood. Seafood? You mean fish and shrimp? Can I come for that? Yes, you. if you must, if you must. Well, let me give you this string. Tied it around his waist and gave boy the other end and said, as soon as the food is ready, because you know, seafood you can't eat cold. Just pull the string and I will be the first one there. Boar stomped off. So Anansi was looking at some oranges, not really to buy, but just to look, because all the food that's coming, you know what I mean? So... And Nancy felt a tug. Oh, who was that? That felt like, mm, that could have been giraffe, but food ready kind of quick. He felt another tug. And all of a sudden, they all tugged at the same time. And Nancy was pulled up off of his feet. And it pulled and it pulled and it pulled. And, it, and Nancy was fighting because now he can't breathe. And his waist went in and in and in. By this time, and Nancy couldn't understand what he did. So he fought and fought and wiggled and wiggled and wiggled until all of the strings snapped one by one. And by the time Anansi got off of the ground and dusted himself off, his waist had shrunk all the way down to the size of a doorknob. <laughs> now when Anansi stood up, he realized that the only thing his belly could hold right now was a half a cup of water. So Anansi had a very, very long time while he waited for his waist to bounce back to understand and learn the lesson that maybe it's not so wise to be so greedy. And that would be why spiders waste this tree. <laughs> that brought me right back. That brought me right back because I have had the pleasure of hearing the story before and reading the story. But again, as I said, today we have an orator. I thank you. I thank you so much for that. And so anybody who is looking for um, entertainment, edutainment, um, if you think that your child's school could use a wonderful afternoon of some traditional folklore and storytelling, if you would like, what actually I'm going to peti peti petition to do is I would like to see these stories read by Keisha on YouTube, because when I looked it up, if you see the atrocities I found, okay? It, you no, know, you really have to type in a Nancy on YouTube I and know. see what some of the, whoa, it's not good. So we need Keisha to populate our YouTube with some, some good um, storytelling. And I thank you. So once more, remember on February 8th, at the Ajax Community Center. Community Center, we are having Talking Tales 2020. It is a family event um, featuring storytelling, music, entertainment, and a marketplace. So you can go to the website, talkingtales.ca. Yeah. You can also stalk her on her social media. You will find her. You can also stalk me on mine, and I will connect you. And so once again, I thank you for joining us. I thank you for being here, and I do hope to see you here again. This is a woman of many passions. She'd be on another show. It'd be totally different. So, Keisha, I thank you for taking the time. I thank you for coming out, and I thank you for continuing the art and sharing the art with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And so that is today's edition of What Matters. Join me again here next week where I will have on Simone Jennifer Smith, a mentor and another host here on TCN, and so much more. Join us then. I'll see you next week. Thanks for coming.